Thank you and welcome to the March 6th Dr. Cog special board of directors meeting. I'm Wynne Shaw, the Dr. Cog board chair. It is four o'clock p.m. Our meeting is now in order. The first business in order is to call the roll and introduce our new members and alternates. Melinda? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we do have one new member with us uh, from the city and county of Denver. We have Adam Paul. Uh, if you're here, welcome, Adam. Uh, and then from there, um, I'll go ahead and do the roll just for everyone that's online. If for some reason you're not able to respond when I call your name, I will ask at the end for you to raise your virtual hand. We'll make sure that you're on the record. All right, uh, here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. <clears throat> Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Present. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. James Marsh Holshin, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. Adam Paul, City and County of Denver. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Well. Lisa Foray, Arvada. Sharon Davis, Arvada. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Here. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Royce Pindell, Bennett. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Here. Yeah. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Chris Fielder, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Roger Hudson, Castle Pines. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Present. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Christine Sweetland, Centennial. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Earl Holen, Cherry Hills Village. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Kim Wright, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Lisa Jones, Foxfield. Wendy Padilla, Frederick. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. <coughs> Excuse me. Ryan Toucher, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Lisa Vitry, Golden. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Idaho Springs, Chuck Harmon. Brian Wong, Lafayette. David Friedland, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlochter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Present. Wynne Shaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Aaron Rodriguez, Longmont. Judy Curran, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Hello. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Tara Bita Fleur, Sheridan. 
Neil Shaw, Superior. Here. Justin Martinez, Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Claire Carmelia, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wee Ridge. Rachel Houtin, Wheat Ridge. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. All right, and for those who were not able to respond when your name was called, can you just raise your virtual hand and I'll read off your names? All right, we have George Teal with us. We have Greg Mills with us. Okay, and I think with that, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum and I will pass it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, our next business in order is uh, the a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, first, are there any changes? And uh, Director Starker? I would move to uh, approve the agenda as presented. Excellent, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Greg Greg Mills. Uh, those in favor of approving the agenda as published, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The ayes have it and the agenda is, a pub is approved as published. Um, Next is report of the chair. The chair is pleased to have you all present this afternoon and appreciate that you've put the time in your schedule to attend this uh, special meeting. Next, we have the report of the executive director, uh, Doug Rex. Uh, Mr. Rex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And I, I do not have a report tonight. I know everybody's anxious to get to the bill, so let's do so. Thank you. Very good. The next business in order is to open the period for public comment. Um, Melinda, do you see any hands raised for public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we'll give it just a moment to see if anyone needs to raise their hand. And I do not see any hands raised. All right, thank you, Melinda. With no one here for public comment, we'll close the period for public comment. Our next business in order is the approval of the consent agenda, which consists of the summary of the February 21st board meeting. Uh, I look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Director motion. Baker. Thank you, I'll, I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Rich Kondo, North Glen. Thanks, Rich. Those, uh, uh, Director Kondo, <laughs> uh, those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion to approve the consent agenda is adopted. The next business in order is a discussion of state legislative issues. First, bills on which positions have already been taken, then bills for consideration and action. The chair welcomes Rich Morrow, the Director of Legislative Affairs. Is Rich here? I'm getting everything turned on. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I will give a brief update on bills that we've taken previous positions on and then move into um, the two new bills on your list. Um, you. So the first bill uh, uh, on the uh, status of bills list is Senate Bill 40. And unfortunately, I don't have any good news for you. In fact, I'm even more worried now than ever before that um, we're not gonna get our funding request. Um, it's not over yet, but um, I've basically been hearing of comments from JBC members that they think we ought to just let um, the decision about funding move with Senate Bill 40 since it's got 
the appropriation in it for $5 million. But even though they know that there's, it'll be almost impossible to find where to get that $5 million if it's not already put as a placeholder in, in the long bill. And they've not committed to putting it in the long bill yet. And they're gonna get their revenue forecast next Friday and they will use that to, um, that'll be the, the number that they get, uh, that they use uh, for the budget. And if they don't set aside 5 million or even if they wanna do less, but if they don't set aside money for the bill at that time, then um, Senate Bill 40 will have to compete with all the other bills in appropriations for funding. And the, what we're hearing right now is that both the House and the Senate will each have about $15 million that they can use to fund bills and appropriations. And the estimate I've heard about so far, bills that are already sitting in Senate appropriations add up to something like $80 million. Uh, so that's pretty much impossible that they would decide to fund one bill with $5 million or maybe even $1 million um, if there's that many other bills to compete with and that little money to spread around. So we're talking about options and increasing the pressure, uh, particularly on the, uh, the chair and the vice chair of the Joint Budget Committee um, to convince them to take action before they close the long bill. So that's short version of where we are now. On Tough that message. <laughs> and so, I mean, we would be interested in any help any of you can provide. Um, if you're willing to talk to um, the Senator and the representatives and urge them to act, it would be greatly appreciated. We're doing what we can down at the, in the building. Um, but if you have relationships with them or feel comfortable talking to them, I will not tell you no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. So then um, the next one is uh, uh, House Bill 1045. I believe, or 1052, I mean, and that's, that one is actually just sitting in appropriations now. Um, it passed out of finance. And so it's just waiting along with all those other bills in, in Senate appropriations. Um, and then let's see, that's going to take us to 1211 the uh, state funding for senior services contingency fund bill. And that's that has passed all the way through and been signed by the governor. So that one is done. And then that takes us to the transportation bills, um, Senate bill 32, uh, which we're supporting is sitting in appropriations committee and Senate Bill 36 um, is in, uh, and that's the Vulnerable Road Users Bill. That one is uh, scheduled for uh, Senate Finance Committee um, a week from yesterday. Um, and then Senate Bill 65 is sitting in Appropriations Committee. And I think that then takes us to um, the housing bills from last last time. Um, the ADU bill has also uh, passed out of committee with amendments and gone to appropriations committee, uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, and that's where it's sitting for the moment. And um, the construction defect bills, which I'm sure you're all following anyway, but um, 1083, I think is still sitting in appropriations. Uh, Senate, or Senate Bill 106, which we're supporting, um, that's still in Senate local government and housing. And I don't think I've seen it calendared yet. 
Um, the last time I looked is earlier today. Same thing with Senate Bill 112, the Lundin Bill. And I think that takes us through all the previously acted along bills and maybe just stop a minute to see if there's any comments or questions on any of those bills. I, I had a couple of questions on two of them that we had amend. Were any amendments accepted? There yes. was the vulnerable um, road users and a couple after that. Yeah, I think there was a vulnerable road users bill. Um, yes, did have amendments. And um, they didn't necessarily uh, address our concerns. There were other more clarifying amendments. Um, I don't know if Doug has any comments or uh, anything else on those, but they, yeah, they, they, they weren't specific to, to our concerns, uh, but they were other amendments. And then I think the ADU bill also had uh, some amendments, but again, I don't think they really uh, were addressing the uh, concerns that uh, that we had addressed or, or raised. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, are, are yeah. there other questions for Rich before he moves on to the bills that we're looking for direction on? Uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, Arapahoe County had previously had an opposed position on 106, the um, um, construction defects bill. And uh, as of yesterday, I believe it was, we've we've gone to an amend to support L um, two of the amendments that have been proposed and we want to submit another one. So we're currently at an amend position on that. Thank you. Jen? Castle? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Director Shaw. Appreciate it. Um, I think there's still work to be done on the ADU bill. Um, I've been in communication with Rich on one point in particular. There is going to be an amendment on second reading being brought forward by Rep Amabile. Um, she will limit the impact on counties, whether that's exclusively removing counties out of the bill um, or not, uh, the the impact to counties will will certainly be uh, reduced in the ADU bill. As far as working with some of our concerns regarding the parking minimums, owner occupancy, um, I think those those are still there's still folks that are hammering on those. Um, we're certainly pushing on those as well, too. So TBD um, on both of those with the ADU bill. And then Thanks. the, yes, of course. And then the, um, Rich is right, the vulnerable road users bill continues to be recalendar, rescheduled. Um, and it seems like they don't like some of our suggestions. So more conversations on, um, on that bill as well, too. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jen, uh, if I could ask you, on the ADU bill, what does it mean to uh, exempt counties or to uh, take counties out of the ADU bill? Uh, does that mean uh, you... cities and cities and counties? Oh. <laughs> or just question. Yes, or good just, question, Director Flynn. Just, <laughs> yeah, just unincorporated parts of, of yeah. counties. Yes, it would be on the unincorporated parts of the county. Um, if some of you are very familiar with that bill, kind of at the last minute, they included unincorporated areas of counties with census designated places of 10,000 right. um, or more. So either they they might just remove that, you know, that whole language or they could increase that threshold of uh, from like 10,000, you know, let's just say to 40,000 population that's, so that's yep. distressing because i have been uh, on my own uh, not as an official denver position but uh asking uh Amarville and the other sponsors and my own reps to uh to include an amendment that would not strip denver or other cities that have adopted specific design standards in different zoning contexts uh this bill strips away all the work denver did the last two years to come up with uh, design standards for alley homes in neighborhoods that do not have alleys. 
So we have different setbacks than, a, than say, a tool shed from the rear lot line. And so I'm distressed to hear that. Thank you. Yep. yep. It does sound like the, the sponsors are willing to have some more conversations, but yeah, that that could be a sticking point for them. I mean, so it'd we'll... be nice if they'd answer their email. We've enabled, <laughs> we're enabling ADUs in on every single family lot in the city later this summer. And that's why we came up with these standards ahead of time to get, uh, to get community buy-in. And uh, if the state strips it away, I don't know how I can go to my constituents anymore and say your input matters, right? Mm -hmm. We have the right. design standards that will enable them in every every single family lot. Why does it matter to the folks up on the hill, whether it's a five foot or a 10 foot setback? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yep, absolutely. Um, and I do apologize. One other update, con the construction defect bill 106. That was debated last night until about nine o'clock. It was last night. Okay. Yep. Yep. And they they laid laid the bill over for action. So I imagine it might be next week until there's some action on that bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. I think uh, Rich, we can move to hey, those bills build? where we're seeking direction. Yes. So the first bill is uh, House Bill 1304, and that's the minimum parking requirement bill, which I know is also controversial um, on both sides, I guess. Um, and it is in House Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee. Um, actually, I think it was um, heard yesterday and sent to Appropriations Committee. Um, I've got uh, something that um, summarizes the five amendments that were adopted, but I thought I'd hold off and see if you want that or if Jen had anything to add. I know uh, Doug and Ron have been paying attention to this bill as well, so um, I will just wait a minute to see if you want me to go into that or if the others have comments about the bill. If Jen has comments, feel free to add them. Sure, thank you, Director Shaw. Thank you, Rich. Um, the bill came out on a partisan vote yesterday when it was heard in committee. Um, you heard some of the arguments that you know you can you could probably imagine. There were some amendments that were put on the bill from from what I'm hearing and just from a quick look at them. Um, they don't do anything substantial necessarily to the bill, certainly as it relates to the local control issue. Um, so I believe, you know, the status quo remains um, with this bill for now. All right. So, uh, Director Levy. Um, uh, Madam Chair, if you're looking for comments or discussion on the bill, I I would love to offer some thoughts, but I uh, don't want to get ahead of where you are. Oh, I think that's appropriate at this time. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Well, I this this may actually surprise um, members of the board um, because Boulder County would maybe be expected to support this bill. However, uh, we actually did vote to oppose uh, because um, while philosophically, um, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself here, um, philosophically, I understand where they're coming from in terms of um, <clears throat> reducing parking, um, uh, which would encourage okay. people not to use their cars and uh, encourage people to think of either bike, ped, uh, bus, other alternatives. Um, it, it, we don't have those alternatives um, in place in, in sufficiently distributed or sufficiently robust that it, that it actually can, can allow people not to have a car. And so in, in by saying you cannot have mandatory minimums, it's going to leave up to the developer whether they want to provide them or not. And and if it's residential development, um, they'll the developers will want to maximize their their rentable space and they won't provide housing and they will just offload the parking that people will want. 
uh, into adjacent neighborhoods. And so I think, so that's how we came to our position of oppose. Um, the dynamic is complex. Every community is different. I, I don't want us to simply say a oh, local control because I think it, I think this and other measures really warrant um, something a little more that, that actually addresses the policy um, because just saying local control isn't enough in my point, in my um, view, it, what we really should be saying is that until we have the infrastructure in place and the land use planning in place that truly would allow people not to need a car for their daily needs, um, we need to, um, developers need to be required to provide that parking. Thank you. And uh, Director Mulvey. Uh, I concur with Director Levy um, because the recognition that people require a car in their daily lives is a matter that I have raised several times in this body about Douglas County. The layout and format, particularly where schools and um, children's activities are, do not permit someone to take their children where they need to go and do their daily activities without a vehicle. So I concur wholeheartedly with that sentiment and I thank Director Levy for articulating it in the way she did. And I thank Boulder um, City and County for being bold enough to admit that. Thank you. Oh, only the county. <laughs> I don't. I can't speak on behalf of the city. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Thank you. I do. My apologies to the city of Boulder. Thank you, uh, Director Lawson. Yes. Um. Thank you. And I do concur with Le Levy on this. But additionally, the city of Aurora opposes this bill because it actually puts all of the the power into the developer and takes the city out of this and we're kind of the ones that kind of know what the surrounding neighborhoods, if we're building, looking at the characteristics of development, it could be big, it could be small. And I think that that's one of our issues. But then the second issue is that in the legislation, it also requires the city to perform and undertake a parking needs study. In the city of Aurora, we already require developers to do that. And if there's a cost assessment to that, that could be very impactful to resources but also to the city budget as well. So that's another reason why, amongst other things that have been stated, why the city of Aurora opposes this bill at this time. Thank you. Uh, Director Dietz. Okay, one second here. Uh, let's start my video here too. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I, yesterday I was, I did testify with our town manager in 1304. Castle Rock opposes this too. I agree with Dr Director Lawson. This is a developer's dream. We already have everything in place that we need in Castle Rock. I think everybody is definitely putting in some good stuff here today. Uh, I also agree with, you know, don't always agree with Boulder, but I agree with Dr Director Levy today. Um, you know, it's good stuff. I think this can be managed at the local level. I don't see any way to amend this. Thank you. Would someone like to offer a motion on how to uh, at, how to direct staff to handle this? Uh, uh, Director Mills? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to oppose the parking minimums bill. Is there a second, Director Teal? Second. Very good. Uh, let us begin. There is a motion and a second, but we should probably assess the number of you that will be abstaining from the vote. So if you could raise your hands. That's great. 
And please just would, would you keep them up until uh, we ask you to put them down? Because we're trying to count when everybody gets them. Right. Is this to oppose? Correct. No. Uh, so right right now, if you're going to abstain from the vote, you should raise Roger your that. hand. We will assess the number who are abstaining, so we can compute a two thirds vote to uh, uh, adopt the opposed position. Can I, okay. can I clarify, Madam Chair? Yes. That, uh, that Denver is abstaining because we have not had, uh, we have not determined an official position between the administration and the council on this. So Certainly. therefore, we're abstaining. Understood. Thank you so much. Okay, Madam Chair, looks like we have nine abstentions. All right. So Melinda knows the two thirds amount and um, those. We need 16 in the affirmative, just FYI. 16, all right. Um, those in favor of taking an opposed position on 1304, please raise your hand, raise your virtual hand. And I'm looking for mine in the uh, reactions button. Be sure people are raising their hand and not there's a clap motion I saw somewhere in my <laughs> so that that needs to be clarified whoever did that right we haven't cat we won't <laughs> capture your vote unless you raise your hand within the reactions button And there was someone who had had their hand raised who has put it down. I just wanted to make sure that they knew they had, they won't be counted. Oh, okay. I guess we're back. Madam Chair, we, we stand at 17 right now based on All my- All right. So we would have enough. I, I will ask for those. Uh, if Doug, we I... all put our hands down, uh, Director Flynn. Uh, Doug, I thought I counted 18. Oh, you did? There were three on the bottom row. Five, oh, five, okay. Five, my, my bad. So 18. Yep. Still 18? passes. All right. So we're putting our hands, oops, down, lower hands. Um, and now I'll ask for those opposed to taking an opposed position. Please raise your virtual hand. One, two. So you... By opposing the direction to oppose, you are actually supporting the bill. Madam Chair, uh, Rappo is at a monitor position. Uh, okay. The way I interpret that is that I cannot um, support the opposed motion if we're at a monitor. Um, Correct. Understand. And I just wanted to make sure with uh, uh, Director Lawson, you've you've lowered your hand. That's great. Thank you. And uh, and I see Director uh, Ferret. Right. I'm down. Okay. Oh, so I voted to oppose it, and my hand was a lingering hand. Okay. All right, and Steve Odoricio has in the chat, Adams County opposes. So, uh, Director Odoricio, did you vote differently? No, I, I totally apologize. I, I was having trouble getting my stuff ready like this, and so I screwed up. We opposed the bill. I don't know if that means we opposed the motion. That was the problem I was having, and I apologize. Okay, so if you... Uh, if you oppose the bill, you would vote yes uh, or to the motion because our motion is to oppose the bill. We vote yes. We, we approve the motion, oppose the bill. Did you vote yes before? Tried to vote yes to oppose the bill. Okay, so we may not have captured you. That's what I'm saying. Madam Chair? Yes. This is Doug. Yeah, we had 18 recorded 
um, votes in the affirmative of the motion. And then there was two additional, uh, Director Odoricio and uh, Director George Lance also texted me. He's having technical problems. So we have 20 in support of the motion. Okay, 20 in support and one opposed. All right, so the motion is adopted. The ayes have it, the motion is adopted. And Dr. Cog will take a, an opposed position to 1304. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I make a suggestion? Certainly. Um, in other environments, when I've been in a Zoom environment, um, a poll has been created in order to actually capture the intended vote of everyone. And it's pretty efficient if Dr. Cog is able to accommodate that. I think that's an idea, but in the poll, it doesn't actually list your name until after you okay. download the data. So I think for the record, we we want to make sure we have the names. Is that correct, Doug? Yes, Madam Chair. I think to an extent, um, Director Mills. Thank you for for the uh, for the option on that. I you know I think the other part is is that you know we do you know we do bring folks over board members to be um, panelists um, that that you know it's kind of a closed shop for voting. But we also have staff and other stakeholders that are also panelists. So in order to be fully transparent and make sure that it's just the members that are voting. Um, you know, we just, we, we do it this way. I, I know it's a bit clumsy. I, I no doubt about it. <laughs> and, and efficiency, you're right. <laughs> so we appreciate the suggestion, but a lot of mitigating factors here. All right. So, uh, uh Chair Shaw, I was just going to point out that Director Harrison said he needed to discuss the reason for abstaining in his chat in the chat so i wasn't sure if no I, okay. no it's just i was just saying that i cannot make a decision i have to go back to my council to talk that's all and that's okay. why i'm staying so right he was just clarifying why he was ab abstaining there were uh what was it nine abstentions or i did not write that um but i know we, we needed that number to determine the two-thirds so we are good on this one. We have decided to oppose 1304. So our next bill is uh, the Transit or Oriented Communities, 1313. And um, is this, uh, I'm, I apologize. Um, so do we want to see the presentation first on this before we vote? Yes. Yeah, Madam Chair. Hi, Doug here. Um, yeah, if if it if it pleases the committee, I, I have a few slides here, just kind of level set. I know there's a lot of folks on this call that are very intimate with this bill, um, but I just want to make sure that everybody that's on the call um, is familiar enough with it to to have a conversation. So if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I'd like to share my screen and just walk through those slides real quick. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, just bear with me here a second. You're going to see a technology whiz. Great. All right. Let me know when you see that in slideshow mode. So it's in the uh, mode yeah. where you see the preview. Yes. I'm trying. I'm clicking. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. No, no, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, thank you also very much for the opportunity. I, I, I'll, I'll just zoom through these real quick, but there are some foundational information associated with this bill that I'd like for everybody to know. Um, we've had a couple presentations, as you know, from uh, governor's office staff associated with this and as well as other bills. Um, but this is the one that I think, you know, we've had the most conversation about. So I'm just gonna hit on some of the highlights associated with. So a summary of the bill itself. Um, I'm sorry, just one second here. I'm trying to get rid of, okay, so I can see it. 
All right. So um, the bill itself, what it does, it basically establishes another category of local governments called transit oriented communities. Um, and uh, it, it creates requirements for each of each transit oriented community to develop a housing opportunity goal. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, it requires um, not only uh, local governments to uh, establish a housing opportunity goal, but also um, also identify affordability strategies and displacement mitigation strategies. And there, there are specific reports that you have to provide the DOLA associated with those by uh, 2026. And I'll talk to those here in a second. All right, let's let's talk about what a transit-oriented community is. So it's it's a um, it's a community that um, uh, th these are prerequisites that is entirely or partially within a metropolitan planning organization. As you know, there are uh, five metropolitan planning organizations throughout the state, four of which are um, uh, are along the Front Range, come uh, from uh, Fort Collins down to Pueblo. And of course, uh, all of our communities, or sorry, the majority of our communities outside of Gilpin and, um, and Clear Creek counties are contained within a metropolitan planning organization's geography. In order to be a transit-oriented community, you must also have a population of greater or equal to 4,000, um, contain at least 75 acres of transit area, and we'll get into transit areas here in a second. And if you're a county, so basically, if you touch a, a rail uh, transit station, or a transit corridor um, that's in an urban environment, then you are uh, considered a transit-oriented community. Okay, so let's talk about the two types of transit areas. So the two types of transit areas are one that are within a half mile of a, of a station that serves either commuter bus rapid transit, commuter rail, light rail, frequent bus service that operates primarily on an interstate highway. So, um, so if you have one of those stations within your community, um, you are considered a transit-oriented community, assuming that that the area around that station, um, well, yes, you are considered a transit-oriented community. Um, also, if you are uh, a transit corridor area that basically serves basically rapid rapid bus transportation, has headways or frequencies of 15 minutes or less during the highest frequency hours, then uh, you qualify uh, as a transit corridor area within your transportation, your transit-oriented community. Um, so uh, I'll show you a quick list of those here in a second based on the latest information we have from the, from the governor's office. As far as the opportunity goal itself and, and, um, and how that's calculated in the lots, uh, in the, in the, um, in the uh, proposed bill, it, um, it's a pretty simple ca calculation. It's based on the total acres of all the transit areas you have within your community. So if you have five rail stations within your community, it's an aggregate of those transit areas. And then, um, uh, uh, and then it's multiplied by 40 units per acre. So for, this, for the sake of argument, for, you know, if you have 75 acres of transit, of, uh, transit area within your community, times that by 40 and your uh, your housing opportunity goal is 30 th is 3000 units. I didn't do that in my head by the way I wrote that down so I, <laughs> I had to get a calculator up. I don't want you to think I'm smarter than I actually am. So but there are um but there are exam parcels as well so it's basically when you calculate that um the, that housing opportunity goal is based on eligible parcels. So there are exam parcels and you can see the list here. We don't believe that this, um, there. I think there are, are other opportunities for, for exam parcels. And if we get an opportunity, we have some proposed amendments for you that that uh, speaks uh, directly to that. But, um, but it's basically, it is a calculation of eligible um, uh, parcels within your, uh, within, uh, within your um, transportation uh, center. All right, the timeline for compliance um, by if uh, if this were the past by January 31st of 2025, um, each TOC must submit a preliminary uh, transit oriented community assessment report, and that 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 assessment report um, shall include a preliminary housing opportunity goal, including the data and methods that in which it was calculated. And it must also include a map of the existing zoning districts within the transportation or transit-oriented community 
that may qualify as transit centers. So you must show the evidence to support your um, your claim with regards to you know how you defined the the boundaries and the the uh, the housing opportunity goal. And then by uh, December of uh, the end of uh, December of 2026, um, there are several reports you have to submit. One of which is the housing um, the housing opportunity goal report, and you have to to submit that report every three years after that as well, um, basically showing progress towards. Um, you're also required um, by by the end of 2026 um, uh, to sh to show that you have met the housing opportunity goal, which would have included in that housing opportunity report. Um, and but there are some provisions in there that you know if um, you and it says you may notify DOLA if there is insufficient water supply to meet that housing opportunity goal. Um, other provisions will be provided. And you know, I think it will be a, a dialogue back and forth with DOLA, exactly how you would define that housing opportunity goal if there were um, significant issues associated with water. Um, you're also required to um, produce uh, or to uh, implement or plan to implement affordability strategies. And those are selected from a list that are provided by DOLA. And um, so, so you're, 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 you're committing yourself to those, to at least two on the main list and then one on a, on a different list. So there's a bunch of strategies that you have to implement. And, and uh, that is also true for the displacement mitigation strategies. It, it, there is a list that is provided um, that will be provided by through DOLA that um, that the the communities are responsible for for uh, implementing. So here's the here's kind of the the map and uh, and and uh, communities that uh, based on uh, the governor's office latest estimates believe are uh, would be affected would be classified as a transit oriented community. And there are 29 within the, the, the Dr. Cog Metropolitan Planning Organization. The only other two, uh, there's one Fort Collins, Fort Collins and uh, Colorado Springs are the only other two communities that are outside the Dr. Cog region um, that would be classified as a transit-oriented community. And listen, this slide was not in your packet. We'll, we'll provide an updated um, uh, presentation for you all. Um, uh, after the meeting's over. All right, so demonstrating compliance. So, you know, when you're designating your transit centers, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, every parcel that's eligible, they, you might, you, you have to have um, it, a net of at least 15 units per acre established. So you can't have any parcels that are not zoned to allow less than 15 units per acre. They have to have a minimum of 15 units per acre. And also, um, so, so, you know, obviously you have to get to that 40 unit per acre average. So if you have parcels that are at minimum 15 units per acre, you know, you got to gain, you know, a lot more on some other parcels, right, in order to get to that average. Um, also, uh, you are responsible, you know, you have to establish an administrative approval process for multifamily developments on parcels of less than five acres. And that's also part of the compliance of this. And, um, you know, they do provide a little bit of flexibility with regards to how you define that that um, that housing opportunity goal that, you know, if you can't get the full 40 units per acre average within the, the, the defined transit area, you can um, look at other parts of your community that are in close proximity to the stations that are, you know, walkable, accessible, those types of things that um, that you that you can use to calculate and help you get to that uh, 40 units per acre uh, average. It's still a little unclear to us exactly how that all works. It's um, um, you know it's it's uh, um, it, it's not as comprehensive in in the in, you know in the language itself. I think you know additional language um, kind of flushing that out a little bit more would be good. But um, but anyway, there is some opportunity to look for that housing opportunity goal to meet that housing opportunity goal by going outside the transit area. Um, a couple other things I might notice real quick, it might also mention real quick that um, when you're ensuring the, the the total zone and capacity of the transit centers, they you know it has to be at least equal to or greater than the housing opportunity goal, of course. And um, you know you must submit as I mentioned earlier the housing opportunity goal report to DOLA for approval 
and then thereafter every every three years. So what happens if you don't meet the housing opportunity goal? Then, well, you become a uh, non-qualified trans uh, transit um, transit-oriented community, um, and how this affects those communities that are not able to qualify is that their um, highway users tax fund allocation will be restricted and will be transferred to a basically a a um, a grant account um, to be used um, as uh, you know to provide incentives for um, um, you know to get um, uh, housing developed within these TOCs. So the so that basically the as far as the dates go, so if DOLA does not approve the TOC housing opportunity goal by the, the end of 2027, um, you know they they also may seek an injunction requiring the TOC to comply. So it's not only that they're you know restricting the HUTF, but they also are reserving the right to um, to seek an injunction against communities to comply with uh, with state law. And that's it for for kind of a general uh, just overview of it. Um, you know, if if there's opportunity, and I'd be interested to see where this conversation goes. But we do have, you know, a series of some proposed amendments that we'd like to like to have a conversation with you um, that we think would add some value to the bill. Um, listen, I'll be honest with you. I think you know if we can get to uh, you know I think more than anything we'd like to stay at the table as staff on this. Um, you know, a lot of the folks they're talking to are, you know, there's there's a lot of lobbyists involved in this and other stakeholders. And I think it's important to have practitioners involved in this conversation too. And and for sure, your community staffs have been have been involved to a degree on this in providing tabletop exercise results and all that kind of good stuff. But um, if there's any opportunity that we can get to a position that allows us to stay at the table, I I, uh, I think that would be a great idea. Understanding that there's some non-starters non with many of you in this bill, primarily associated with the preemptions. Um, but I, but Madam Chair, I think I'll I'll just turn it back to you to uh, to open up that conversation. But understanding that we, you know, if we get to the point that we can share some of our amendment strategy, we'd like to do that. Thank That's you. That's great, and. Uh, and I will add that uh, uh, I think um, in the past we've we've uh, recommended a position of, for example, oppose unless amended. But I've learned that uh, legislators really need to submit either a support, oppose, or amend position uh, when they kind of associate uh, with the legislators. So um, so uh, I think what Executive Director Rex was saying is that perhaps uh, a position of amend might keep us at the table. And, you know, they're knowing that we want to do away with the, uh, the punishments and uh, preemptions. Are there questions? We should probably open this up to discussion. Uh, Director Mulvey. I almost forgot to unmute. Yes, my my question relates to the fact of when you have an unincorporated county that is nearby a transit a, a community that's not defined within the statute. So you have a unincorporated area of the county that is required to comply with the statute that surrounds or is nearby a town that doesn't. And so my question is whether or not there was discussion by the drafters or in committee of how that might impact the local government and or any funding that the county might offer to the local government because roads go through both the town that doesn't apply, it doesn't apply to and the county that it does. Madam Chair, if I may. Certainly. Director, no, uh, Director Mulvey, that's a, that's a very interesting question and it's not one that I've really, um, contemplated to be honest with you and I might even if Ron or Sheila is on the call and they'd like to weigh in on this that that's wonderful I understand the, 
the question exactly is like you could have a situation in which um you know a local a local government does not meet the prerequisites of a transit oriented community but you could have an unincorporated part uh, unincorporated part of a county that is adjacent to a rail station for example um what would happen in that case right is that your question if i understand it yeah because and and the end result perhaps unintended is that the county's non-compliance or requirements then prohibit what would otherwise be sharing of funds yeah that's I, due to the nature of that proximity yeah i would think that you know just based on the definition as i understand it of a transit oriented community that the county would still be responsible if they're adjacent you know if if, if if a county contains part of a transit station area in an unincorporated area or contains transit area in an unincorporated area fully encompassed by a local government. So the first part, it seems to suggest that they would, the the, the, the county would be a transit oriented community. Ron, Shield, okay. Lifeline. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, then the question becomes, has it been considered or discussed that if the county doesn't comply and loses its HUTF funding, it then can't share in the transit needs of the region, totally outside of what Dr. Cog might do, but the county sometimes offers contributions to projects that touch both the incorporated and the local government. So has it been discussed that a county that's not in compliance and loses its funds would then unintentionally impact a community it never intended to impact. It's a wonderful question, Deb, uh, Deb, that Director Mulvey. Uh, Mulvey, I um, and I don't know the answer to be honest, but that is one we will definitely take back. I'd welcome anybody that might have an answer to that, but that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. If there are no uh, responses, we'll move to Director Levy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. And I want to thank Director Mulvey for posing a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, and well, first of all, um, we do believe that parts of Boulder County are subject to this. There are some segments of South Boulder Road um, in the eastern part of the county that have that would be a, a transit corridor that are wholly um, surrounded by municipalities. Um, my question is, whether the bill makes any provision for um, creating job centers, commercial um, areas in, in these transit station areas, because we need a place for the people that live in the high density housing that are going to easily going to be able to get on transit now. We need a place for them to go, and. Does does it require I, I and I, I'm asking I, I don't mean this as a rhetorical question I'm I'm asking this genuinely because I don't know um, does it would it require potentially rezoning all this land to um, to whatever the appropriate zone district is for that residential density and um, and not having any commercial retail uh, office type uses in these areas. Madam Chair, if I may. Certainly. Yeah. Um, Director Levy, thank you for the question. And it's my understanding of the bill does not make that provision. I think they, you know, some of the tabletop exercises that they've done themselves, they would suggest that, you know, um, the 40 units per acre uh, provides maybe enough opportunity to allow for other commercial retail establishments to exist, coexist with what they're proposing in this bill. Um, it might be maybe it's residential above a grocery store or, you know, something like that. Right. But yeah, it's my understanding that it does not contain any specific language in there associated with, um, you know, mixed use, you know, okay. development. Yeah, thanks. So just to follow up, um, what I think you're saying is that as long as you can meet that 40 units per acre, 
uh, within within the defined area, you you wouldn't have to rezone all of the land for high density residential. Uh, you could keep some of it as commercial, office, retail, whatever. That you okay, thanks. Correct, correct. And I see Ron Papstorf has his hand up, Madam Chair. He might yes. want to correct what I just said. Correct. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and Doug and Director Levy. I think that the the question's a good one. And the way the my understanding of the way the bill is structured, my read of the language is that it would not prohibit a subject community from having, say, a mixed use zone, as long as that zone allowed at least allowed residential density of at least 15 units per acre. That's sort of the minimum bar within the within whatever transit center you designate uh, to meet the housing opportunity goal. Um, and you could potentially, but if you had land that was exclusively zoned for a non-residential use and didn't allow residential use on that parcel, you could not include that parcel in the designated transit center the way the bill is currently crafted. Yeah. Because hmm. you have, yeah, that's right, Ron, because you have to have a minimum 15 units per. The, the transit, the transit center definition requires that it is made up solely of parcels that allow at least 15 units per acre. So it could be a mixed use zone classification that allowed a residential density of 15 units per acre. But if the, if the zoning designation for a parcel didn't include any provision for residential or a residential density of of more than 15 of at least 15 units per acre it could not be included in the designated transit center so what if um just to clarify a a parcel is uh zoned commercial mixed use and the purchaser of the property wants to do a 30 story office building and nothing else, then they can't do that because there's no residential within that building? Um, Madam, Madam Chair, I, um, I believe the way the, that I read the language in the bill is that depending on how your zoning code is crafted, okay. if, it, if it allows mixed use and allows residential density, of at least 15 units per acre can be included in the transit center designate in the designated transit center that you've designated to beat the housing opportunity goal. Um, and I guess, depending on how your zoning code was structured for that zoning classification, it could potentially allow a developer to do a straight up commercial building if that was also an allowed use in the in that zoning classification or in that zoning category, which is I think part of the issue with with the bill is that in some ways it's a bit of a paper exercise to demonstrate that there's zoning capacity for housing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that all of that housing um, is going to get developed. Right. Okay. Thank you. Stick uh, around, uh, Ron. Yeah. Uh, Director Martinez. Uh, yeah, thank you. My my question is about the the compliance uh, piece of this bill. Um, I'm not clear on, you know, so we've got these uh, density requirements. We've been talking in terms of units per acre. Um, is the compliance about, uh, you know, driving the our jurisdictions to change our our zoning? And so will we be in compliance just by changing our rules and regulations or does the actual um, development have to be built in order for it to be compliant? So let's let's say we change our zoning to to facilitate that compliance, but we can't find developers that want to build there. Are we out of compliance then? Madam Chair. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Director Martinez. Um, this is actually one I can answer. I yeah. Uh, so, so this is a, the bill itself is really, it's a land use capacity bill, right? It's a zoning capacity bill. It's not a unit, unit production bill. Um, so, so basically what that means is that um, it is, it is a land use ex exercise. It does not suggest that you would be out, you, you would not be out of compliance if the units were never built. Um, 
uh, around your stations. Um, it is just providing the regulatory framework um, to allow those units to be built. Great. Okay, that answers my question. Thanks. Thank you. Director Wong. Yes, thank you. And I think that um, Executive Director Rex cleared up my question in regards to is it actual units built or is it more of a tabletop exercise? And I know that um, what I can share is that this was actually discussed last night at our council meeting. And this is the first piece of legislation that Lafayette will actually be taking a position on um, as opposed to just due to our density of our compact community um, and in regards to what our staff has presenting that we would have to um, use resources to map out everything and, and what that would look like and the significant changes to our zoning. While we certainly support transit hubs and high density housing around those hubs, this is simply asking community our size um, with a number of transit corridors, both Highway 7, 287, um, and a regional transportation bus system that goes through our community to do more than more than most of the others in our surrounding um, communities in Boulder County. So for that reason, since we are as a council already moving forward with an oppose, um, that's where that's where Lafayette stands. And I just want to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harrison. Thank you, um, and. Um... Director Wong kind of touched on it briefly, and that was with Highway 7. And so obviously there's multiple, they're going to be building a whole BRT corridor from Lyman to Boulder. It's going to be going through multiple communities. Just from I-25, if I can think about it, it's going to be Thornton, Broomfield, Erie, Lafayette, and then obviously going all the way down through Boulder. So for Erie, we're not listed here, but would we not be, should we be part of that? in terms of, because there's an impact because we are doing development on the south side there currently uh, within our area and wanted to get a kind of clarity there on that. Madam Chair, if I may, yeah, uh, Director Harrison, yeah, maybe we can have an offline conversation about that just to kind of touch base. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, we've heard similar type stories from um, from some of our members that might not be listed on here that had some clarification. We'd like to just dig into details a little bit more with you. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Yeah, it'd be great. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Lawson. Yes, thank you. So the city of Aurora has a lot of concerns with this bill, and we are going to be taking an opposed position. Um, I have a question for you, but I just wanted to just express some of the, the reasonings. I mean, the city of Aurora, we're already doing this. Um, it's in our strategic plan priorities, and we're working within our growing community to already do this. We have TOD sites already with, with um, transit next to it. Um, but to take away our huff you know, that really would impact our city in terms of, you know, maintaining our infrastructure and our roads, that would be very, very bad for our community in general. Um, but the question that I have um, in looking at the bill and kind of evaluating a little bit more, um, and I don't think something that we've talked about or, or, or the sponsors are even looking at, we're trying to bolster this existing transit services, but Shouldn't we try to improve the infrastructure of the transit infrastructure to make sure it's reliable even before mandating municipalities to increase density in the areas where transit may not be accommodating? And if you kind of look at this time frame of 15 minutes, I mean, I, we live, I live right by the R line at the nine mile station. It's not coming every 15 minutes. That's why a lot of people get on the roads to go to work because it's not meeting that. And that's due to resources at RTD as well drivers, people to, to accommodate those things. So I don't even see this even being discussed in the bill. And I guess from you, what I wanted to ask, is that something that has been talked about? Because that's a big part of this as well. And sorry for my long comments on that. No, no thank you. No, Madam Chair, no, thank you. <laughs> Director Lawson, thank you for the question and comments. I think it it's right in line with some of the conversations that we've been having with uh, Governor Staff and, and uh, sponsors on this bill. Um, I'll be honest, I just feel there's a true underappreciation for the amount of work that local governments have been doing in this space. 
Um, I point to um, uh, all the time that, and Aurora was part of this this process, Director Lawson. That we uh, we ran a uh, an initiative that was called the Station Station Area Master Plan, um, and it's called STAB. And on, and part of this that we did we did um, zoning overlays on many of our rail stations within well, well almost all the fast tracks rail stations. Um, and you know, as a result, a lot of those stations were rezoned, were upzoned to a higher density mixed use development. To you know, that was a result of that that, that planning analysis, right? So, I don't know. I just feel um, that they're not taking into consideration the tremendous amount of work and the context that you all work in and understanding your communities and what what you know what can be accommodated with around your with rail stations. Um, so yes, I, you, everything you said is, is on point with what the conversations that we've been having for having with uh, with um, uh, you know governor staff and others. Thank you. So there's a, a question from Director Levy about hearing some of the amendments that Dr. Cog has in mind, and that might be if Director Flynn and Mulvey Baker and Levy will oblige. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to sh share my screen again. Stay tuned. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quick. Okay. Yeah. So we have um, a few amendments that we want to give you for consideration. And now I will tell you that these are these are. Besides the, um, you know, I know there are some concerns about, um, you know, the, uh, you know, HUTF being used as a stick in this, as well as the the possibility of an injunction. I, the, those are, you know, those are one thing. These are a bunch of more, more uh, generalized uh, amendments that we think can provide some value in this bill, because, you know, if this bill does proceed, we want to make sure that it's the best bill it can be from our perspective. So these are just a few that we're we uh, would like to throw open for for you all. Um, you know, first of all, we'd like to more clearly define BRT, and this probably gets to Director Harrison's uh, comment earlier, right? About you know, we want to make sure that um, you know that we want you know that the the service is being provided with a frequency that we all agree is what is characterized as BRT. Um, and to uh, Director Lawson's point earlier, you know, I mean, we have rail routes right now that are not operating at 15 minutes, let alone, you know, some bus lines. So that's one thing that we, we thought we'd, we'd add. We also think there's opportunity here to add to the exempt parcels list on this, most notably associated with uh, with public utilities and private utilities. I know Arapahoe County in their presentation that they, um, they gave to the sponsors, they talked about, you know, the uh, public utilities adjacent to um, and the costs associated with, you know, possibly moving those um, would be just astronomical and, would, you know, it just wouldn't happen. But that currently is included in in parcels that you have to use to come up with your housing opportunity goal. Um, you know, uh, another uh, area that we looked at when we did a tabletop exercise on Westminster Station um, there was in neighborhoods to the south that we, you know, were at high risk for displacement, and we just believe there should be an exemption in place for those communities. Um, and um, you know, actually, Ron, I I don't if Ron's on the line, he can explain the next one. Um, parcels with existing development since 2014. I don't know what the 2014 date was, Ron, but if you're on the yeah. line, <laughs> thanks, Doug. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I look, I, I will admit. 2014 is a bit of an arbitrary number, but it, the, the point is in some of the station areas, and I think to Director Levy's point, in, in some existing station areas or long quarters, there's pretty significant development that's relatively recent that by their inclusion in calculating the housing opportunity goal um, and having to potentially rezone a piece of land that has a significant office or retail development that's relatively new, that's not going to be redeveloped anytime soon, and you may not actually want it to redevelop, is putting those communities at a serious 
uh, putting them in a very challenging position to try to even identify enough land, enough zoning capacity to meet the housing opportunity goal. So that's the reason for making some provision for existing development that, you know, kind of that aren't likely to be redeveloped or you wouldn't want to redevelop as as part of this process. Thank you, Ron, very much. So the next. And I will mention that we're down to our 15 minutes and we still need to vote. So uh, <laughs> keeping comments brief would be appreciated. Director uh, Flynn is next. Uh oh, the gauntlet has been laid down. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, Doug or Ron, you speak to something that I don't know is unique to Denver because I don't know the zoning codes of other jurisdictions, but in Denver we have a form-based zoning code. We don't zone for units. We zone for form, building forms. And uh, I, I like the point that was made earlier about uh, you know, uh, counting not just residential around the station, but I'm thinking, uh, uh, Chair Shaw, about Sky Ridge Medical Center. There's yes. a station right there, but so much of that land is taken up with medical facilities. That is in, in itself a transit generator, people yes. taking the train to the hospital. But what is around there to meet your your housing opportunity goal or HOG? I wish they would change that to uh, housing opportunity target or something. But with a form-based code, I could have a parcel that uh, a developer could build a 50,000 square foot building. Depending, uh, I don't know how many units that's going to have. So Doug, Ron, can you give us some guidance for what you've heard? You could have 100 studio apartments there, 500 square feet, if it were 50,000 net uh, leasable space, or you could have 45 to 50 two-bedroom apartments or three-bedroom apartments, uh, maybe uh, 30, right. 35 of them, which is better for my district, which is more family-oriented. So how does this legislation, in, in your view, address the form-based code issue where I, I could upzone everything around me, but I have no idea if it'll be 100 units 50 or, or just one big, uh, you know, one big uh, Mar-a-Lago, right? <laughs> yeah. no. Great question, Director Flight. I, Ron, or, I saw Jen turn on her camera. I don't know if she has any comments on this. But Ron, is there anything that you have related to this? I wish I had a good answer for you, Director Flynn, but I really don't. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Sheila popped on. Maybe Sheila has some, um, some additional comments. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Director Flynn, for bringing this up. We did a little bit of looking at different station areas where we have our communities have already rezoned and most of them take a form-based code approach. And so the tricky piece is the intention of form-based code is to allow for denser developments in areas, but it doesn't necessarily prescribe how many units. I think what I've heard on calls with some of the folks that have worked on this bill is that their goal really is to create zoning capacity. And they're not quite as concerned about, in the end, how many units are built in that area. Um, the, the tricky thing is, though, we've also heard from others, like infrastructure providers, that that is, that is a, a challenging approach only because you typically when a community is thinking about a rezoning, they're doing some analysis about what would it take to serve those units from a utilities perspective. So I don't know if that helps with the answer, but um, yes, we looked at Arvada, Aurora, Nine Mile Station, as Director Lawson mentioned, and most of those uh, codes that are in place, they're transit-oriented codes, and they take more of a form-based approach. Excellent. So it sounds like uh, coming up with the uh, average of 40 units per acre might be more an art than a science. It's Thank going to be you. difficult. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Director Mulvey is next. Ten yeah, minutes. Um, <laughs> quick concern regarding a park and ride. If I read the definitions of transit station area, it includes a park and ride, which I don't know if that's intended to do what that does, but when you have a park and ride next to a park, next to an undeveloped area, the rest of which is not actually a station, do they intend to include that, a park and ride? Good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, Director Levy. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
I when we when we get to what position we should take, um, I I think we should be in an amend position uh, so that we can continue to be at the table. And I think there have been some really great ideas um, discussed here this afternoon, including the ones that uh, Dr. Cog staff had already proposed. Um, I want to just mention two other issues. Um, one is that for our analysis, our, our uh, GIS folks um, did identify um, several enclaves within unincorporated Boulder County that would be considered um, transit, uh, transit centers. And to meet the terms of this bill would require us to violate our current comprehensive plan which, and the goal of it is, it isn't to have low density residential and be a suburban community. That's ex exactly not what we want. What we want is for development of this density to be in municipalities where they will be served by municipal water and sewer, uh, where, where the, there will be other city services. And so be, uh, we understand this, um, the one of the ways in which counties get included, and it's the way Boulder County would be included, is that these are enclaves. And what what we hope is that, um, and I can't say this with respect to all of our enclaves, but to with respect to many of them, we hope that ultimately they will be annexed into the municipality. And if we're forced to um, upzone them, to comply with the bill, then that's going to interfere with the ability of the municipality to to master plan for these areas, and we don't we don't want that. We're just go, tomorrow or yeah tomorrow we're going to be considering some major rezonings in the Lyons area, so that when Lyons is ready to annex, they will be able to control that what this community looks like, and so. I, you know, I don't want to just say, okay, take take counties out, <laughs> because other counties have different master plan goals, but that's not our master plan goal. And and the other the other thing is, that, you know, concerns that I think we've all expressed about where's the transit, and more people. Um, I understand the goal, and it's a good goal, is that we need to have a built environment that supports transit. And we need a critical mass of density in order to do that. But because Dr. Cog is funded by sales tax, um, and and the the fare box, um, you know, doesn't really provide that much, they're not going to get additional revenue to provide the service that all of these additional people living in these TOCs are going to need. And so I I think this this bill or some other bill has to provide the the resultant funding to RTD to be able to serve those people. And, and, you know, you brought up that transit lines need to uh, provide for housing, but also for business. Um, you, you have to be going somewhere. <laughs> and sometimes that's a business. So I think that's a, that's a real tough question as well. Uh, Director Odoricio. Um, I put a few things in the in the uh, from our notes from our staff of what we've discussed because we're trying to we think amend is the right way for a number of reasons both operationally there are some things that we may need to do to uh, make the bad parts of the bill better. And there may be a situation where we may be stuck with some of this bill. And so sometimes we have to make a bill that we don't like, even a bad bill, better than not as bad as it may have been. And so uh, that's the operational policy side of it. The political side is we know that uh, that the environment down at the Capitol is one that um, people do not have a lot of tolerance for uh, productive conversations that may be deemed to be conflict. And unfortunately, we could all probably take some classes and therapy on how to address those issues, but we don't have time to do that. Um, so what we're saying is uh, staying in a men might give us more options to uh, have productive conversations. So rather than repeat some of the amendments that I've shared, uh, I will just ask that we, we do the amendment we try to get this stuff that we can 
stay at the table and engage as much as possible. Acknowledge that the governor staff, I believe, is trying to work hard to find a solution. I suspect, and I have a crystal ball, if anyone wants to use it, that says that we're going to be in the same situation last year, that the House may be a different situation than the Senate. And we might need to make sure that we don't piss off the people in the Senate that we may need to rely on to make some of those uh, reasonable changes. Uh, finally, I also want to remind everyone that, like, I know none of us like HUTF. We don't like it either. But there are some things that we still can add to the bill uh, that if you see, like when it comes to affordability, one of the things Adams County is concerned about is affordability. Those practices or strategies, if there are other strategies that we want to make sure that are added to either the affordability piece and or the displacement piece, that we, the practitioners of cities and counties, uh, weigh in on that. Because the more you have of those options for us, the more flexible that bill can be for all of us. So please look at those strategy lists and make sure that if you have ideas, we add as much as we can. So if we're stuck with a bill that requires us to say, choose two or three of these strategies in order to, you know, whatever, that we have those options. So it's it's very technical, but we need to look at that and we need to get our staffs together and say, what other strategies do we want to add to that list in case we have to rely on that list? It might make sense. Thanks. So D Director Odoricio, would you like to frame this as a motion to amend 1313? Indeed. Knowing that we have a few other folks wanting to talk, I will still make the motion and they, their discussion could be regarding that motion. I would make the motion to amend given the uh, input that we've given to staff. Second. Is there a second? Director second. Teal? Happy to second if, if Commissioner Baker will uh, yield. Yield. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have additional comments, Director Teal? None then. So no, Madam Director Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Director Maurer. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I agree with what Director Terizio was saying as Tammy Maurer, but as representing my city of Centennial, we have the home rule. And, you know, part of our legislative policy is, you know, we cannot go against that. So I would have to oppose for that reason. Understood. Thank you. So let's let's get a count. We have a motion and a second. So let's get a count of those who would have to abstain from this, from voting on this motion. If you would raise your hands, yes, thank you. And that looks like seven. Yep. Um, and uh, so, Melinda, if you would do a quick calculation of what we need for two thirds. Sorry, I was trying to find my unmute button. Uh, we would need 16. 16 again. All right, great. So those who are uh, abstaining can put your hands down. And we'll call for uh, hands up if you support the motion to amend 1313. So it looks like we have 14, we'll also call for those opposed to raise their hands. Madam Chair, um, Mayor Lance is also a no, he's having technical issues. Oh, okay. 
So that looks like that would be seven opposed, including Director Lance. Um, so we had 14 in favor. The motion is lost. Uh, we will not uh, give staff direction to amend. So I guess maybe we can talk more <laughs> next yeah. next time. Madam, Madam Chair, I know there's a number of hands being raised here now. I mean, I guess if nothing else, we can, um, you know, we can clearly continue to monitor the bill and provide input. Certainly. Director Odoricio? And that's what I was going to ask next is outside of the position, I, I think what Doug Rex has just said, I think we just need to stand behind is that we may not be asking for amendments, but at the very, you know, we're monitoring officially, but it makes sense that that our staff from Dr. Cog is able to at least share the feedback and the uh, input that was received in this productive conversation, unless there's like an objection to saying stay out of the room and off the table, out of uh, not sitting at the table. I just want to make sure we agree it's still better to be in the room and at the table, even if right not. Very good. Um, our next board meeting is scheduled for March 20th. We're downtown in person. And are there other matters from members? Seeing none, it is 530 and we are adjourned. Thank you for attending today. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.